Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show Words on Film, which is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and today I'm going to review five movies for you. First, though, I'm going to start the show off the way I normally start it off, which is giving you what's topping the box office, the top ten highest grossing movies of this past weekend. Before I get to that, though, let me just remind you that you are either, <clears throat> excuse me, you are either listening to the show on bostonfreeradio.com watching it on Somerville Community Access TV or whatever local affiliate is picking me up, or you're watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on the Boston Free Radio Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I am very glad and, in fact, overjoyed that you could join me. Now, here's what's topping the box office. There are a couple of surprises, but none really in the top five. I expected the last, the, the top one, two, and three movies from last week to be pretty much the same this week, and as it turns out, they are exactly the same as they were last week. Number one at the box office for the second week in a row is, no surprise here, The Fate of the Furious, and it's amazing how well this movie is doing around the world. It's doing pretty well here in the United States, but around the world it is breaking so many records, it's unbelievable. So The Fate of the Furious this weekend grossed a decent $38.4 million. Against a budget of $250 million, The Fate of the Furious has so far grossed $163.3 million, so more than half of its budget here in the States. So it's not a hit yet here in the States. However, around the world, The Fate of the Furious has so far grossed $908.3 million. It is this close to grossing a billion dollars, which is pretty incredible and probably means that there's a ninth movie coming, even though the people who made this movie insist that the eighth one is the last one. I don't think so, given the numbers. The Boss Baby, just like last week, is number two this week in its fourth week in release, having grossed $12.7 million. Against a budget of $125 million, The Boss Baby has so far grossed in the United States $137 million even. Around the world, it has grossed $359.7 million, making it a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit around the world. Beauty and the Beast, the live-action remake, is number three at the box office this weekend in its sixth week in release. And in its six weeks in release, it has never been below number three at the box office. That's really impressive. So this weekend, it grossed $9.7 million. Against a budget of $160 million, Beauty and the Beast has so far grossed $470.8 million just here in the United States. Around the world, it has grossed $1.1 billion so far. That is incredible. I mean, last week it, it crossed the $1 billion mark, but the fact that this week, it, well, the fact that it's still going strong is really impressive. Going in Style was number four at the box office last week, excuse me, number five at the box office last weekend. This weekend is number four, having grossed $4.9 million. So while it's not pulling in the same numbers as The Fate of the Furious or Beauty and the Beast or even The Boss Baby, it's still doing well given its budget of $25 million. Against that budget, Going in Style has so far grossed $31.7 million here in the States and 50, that's 50.9 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it's already a certified hit, so good job for that movie. Smurfs The Lost Village was number four at the box office last weekend. This weekend it's number five at the box office, having grossed $4.9 million, just a fraction less than what Going in Style grossed. Against a budget of $60 million, which actually isn't bad given the scope of this movie, Smurfs The Lost Village has so far grossed $33.4 million here in the United States and $133.7 million around the world, which makes it not a hit yet here in the States but around the world, it is a certified hit. Born in China is the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it is the number six movie at the box office. Not a lot of strong competition for new movies here, but that may change by next week. We'll have to see. But Born in China, which is the Disney documentary about animals that are native to China, such as polar bears, but also other species as well, grossed $4.8 million 
here in the United States, and that is against a budget that is undisclosed. Around the world, it is 14 point it, it grossed $14.3 million. I can't say whether or not it's a, it's a hit, a flop. I can't tell right now because I don't have the budget information for you, but hopefully I will next week. Unforgettable, number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number seven at the box office, having grossed $4.8 million, just a fraction less than what Born in China grossed. Against a budget of $12 million, Unforgettable has so far grossed that much in the United States and $6.5 million around the world, making it neither a hit here in the States or around the world. It's not looking particularly good for this movie, but given its low budget, it should at least break even, I think. Gifted is a movie that's actually hovering under the radar. Gifted was number six of the box office last week. This weekend it fell slightly to number eight, but it grossed $4.6 million against a budget of just $7 million. In the United States so far, it has grossed $10.8 million, and I don't have the international numbers for you right now, but Gifted so far in the United States is a tentative hit. The Promise, which is the third highest grossing debut movie of the week, is number nine at the box office. And this is a movie we haven't heard a lot about, despite the fact that it stars Oscar Isaacs and Christian Bale. It premiered last year in September at the Toronto International Film Festival, but just relieved a just received a wide-ish release this week, but not a very strong debut, having grossed $4.1 million at the box office against a budget of $90 million. Let me say that again. $4.1 million it grossed in the United States so far against a budget of $90 million. That hurts, just saying it. And I haven't even seen the movie yet. It's not one of the five I'm going to review for you for this show. But making its debut in the top ten is The Lost City of Z. Not a strong debut, but it is at number ten, having grossed $2.1 million. While I don't have the budget information for you, I can say that so far, The Lost City of Z has grossed in the United States $2.3 million, and around the world, $5.2 million so far. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Unforgettable. And I had a great tagline for what I thought of this movie, but actually my producer, Dave Ortega, who you, you don't see, but he's operating the camera for my televised version of the show, actually guessed right on the spot what I was going to say about this movie. But I'm going to say it anyway. Unforgettable is a very forgettable movie. That's basically all there is to say about the film. So anyway, Unforgettable is a movie that stars Rosario Dawson and Katherine Heigl, and it actually marks the directorial debut of Denise DeNovi, who is a producer by trade and has produced a number of really stellar films over the last couple of years, particularly some for director Tim Burton, such as Edward Scissorhands, Batman Returns, and maybe even the original Batman too. but either way... Um, uh, and even some recent movies as well, such as Crazy Stupid Love. So this is the first movie she's directed, or at least the first one she's directed for the big screen. And unfortunately, it's not a particularly strong debut. It's a move. Uh, let me just read the the, ta the tagline for you. A woman sets out to make life hell for her ex-husband's new wife. If this tagline sounds even the slightest bit familiar to you, it's probably because it describes at least, at least 20 Lifetime movies. And if it, if it hadn't been for the fact that I was seeing this movie in a theater and the fact that it has Rosario Dawson in it, who I like very much, I would think this is a Lifetime movie because it has pretty much all the same qualities of a Lifetime movie. It takes place in a posh neighborhood. Everyone in the movie looks perfect. And the plot is paper thin. And what else can I say about it? I did say last week as I was going through my, my segment, What's Coming Up Next, that maybe, just maybe, this movie would be a, a comeback vehicle for Katherine Heigl. Well, it isn't. Katherine Heigl is one of the worst things about this movie. She basically plays a psychotic porcelain doll. Not literally, of course, but basically she plays someone who is very vain, 
very obsessed over her ex-husband when a woman who looks like Katherine Heigl could have any guy she wants. She could just walk in a bar, and within five seconds, she's got a man. But the woman in this movie doesn't quite realize this for plot's sake. So I've got about four and a half minutes to tell you exactly what I think of the film. I do have to say I liked Rosario Dawson in it. I, I honestly have to say Rosario Dawson has been in a few bad movies. Men in Black 2 comes to mind. The Adventure of Pluto Nash is another one. But she's usually pretty decent in the bad film she's in. Here, I didn't have a problem with her acting. What I had the biggest problem with was the story and Katherine Heigl basically being hammy and just not convincing as either a suburban mom or a psychopath, which is what she's trying to be in this movie. And she is trying, but she's obviously failing. I think Rosario Dawson in this movie does what she does best, which is plays a very approachable down-to-earth woman, and there's nothing really wrong with that. What I was actually surprised about, though, was the fact that I didn't really fear for Rosario Dawson's safety. In, in fact, I think the problem with casting Katherine Heigl in this movie is if you put Rosario Dawson and Katherine Heigl together and had them fight, my money would be on Rosario Dawson. She'd win. I mean, there's just no question about that. I think it might be because Rosario Dawson has more street smarts, or at least she's played that kind of character before. I just, But my money basically goes on Ms. Dawson on this one. But also, I think there were some producer interference, particularly male producer interference, with this movie. Because there were some scenes that were meant, I think they were ori originally written by the screenwriters to be suspenseful, but instead I think they came off as too sexy. There's one scene, for instance, where Rosario Dawson is about to take a bath, and you can sense from the camera movements that someone is in the house, and that she should be afraid. Or at least that's how it's supposed to be played. But you see... Rosario Dawson stripped down to nothing and s no full frontal nudity, but she does step into the tub and then the doorbell rings and you're supposed to be afraid. But I was thinking to myself, there is no way I don't think that a woman director who's self-respecting would shoot this kind of scene and expect the movie to be credible. So that's why I think that there was some producer interference with this film, particularly male producers. And while I don't have any experience in Hollywood or any not too much experience with filmmaking, what I do realize, particularly from what I've heard, is that it's, it's usually not a director's vision that you see on the screen when you're watching a film. The... the I'm, I'm trying to think of the right words. The, the screenplay is written, and then it's tossed over to producers, and then there are about 20 or 30 revisions with a whole group of screenwriters, producers, all the rest. I get that. The problem is that this kind of interference can ruin a film, and I'm not even sure if the, the process has ever helped a film Although I could be wrong. I haven't really heard any producer side of the story in that regard. But the, the point is that Unforgettable, you would expect a movie called Unforgettable to be about memories and how maybe your mind plays tricks on you. There's none of that here. It's just basically a standard stalking, suspenseful movie, and it just doesn't really... It isn't very suspenseful. Katherine Heigl was not credible at all. She turns in probably one of her worst performances ever. And Rosario Dawson might be the movie's saving grace, but she doesn't save it from getting my rating of a flunk out. This is a movie where I kept checking my watch. It's just not very good. There are many 
Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next movie I'm going to be reviewing is The Lost City of Z. This is a true-life drama centered on centering on British explorer Colonel Percival Fawcett, who disappeared while searching for a mysterious city in the Amazon, the, the Amazon River, in the 1920s. So this movie is directed by James Gray, who also wrote the screenplay for the film based on the book, uh, the 2009 nonfiction book by David Gran. And James Gray has... Uh, okay, the internet's being a little bit slow for me, so I can't exactly tell you what movies he's directed, but I, he, he certainly shows his experience with this film. And Percy Fawcett in this movie is played by Charlie Hunnam, who you might remember probably most prominently from his role in Sons of Anarchy, as well as some other as well as some other movies and TV shows of note. And he co-stars in this movie with Robert Pattinson, who plays his right-hand man, Henry Coston. And the movie starts out with showing Colonel Percival Fawcett as a skilled explorer and hunter, not to mention a family man, who is ordered by the British government to travel to Bolivia in order to recover some rubber tree plants. Because back at the turn of the century when this movie took place, rubber was a very valuable commodity. Now it's something we take a little bit for granted. It's something we, well, I, I won't tell you the uses of rubber. You can probably figure it out for yourself. But the point is, it was very valuable at this time. So Colonel Fawcett brings, or, or rather travels the Amazon on a raft along with his fellow comrades, including the aforementioned Henry Coston. And he travels on the Amazon for two years searching for these rubber trees. And he, of course, leaves behind his family. But he comes back successfully from the trip, having recovered the rubber. But he also finds, during one particular pit stop, when his crewmates are especially hungry and haven't eaten for a while, that there is actually an ancient lost city based on certain pieces of circumstantial evidence that he hopes to discover. And because of his love for exploring, not to mention his dedication for his royal majesty, he returns to the Amazon on numerous occasions. Even a stint fighting in World War I does not stop him from returning to the Amazon. So this movie tells a good true story, and the acting is decent. In fact, the acting, is, I think it would probably be very good. The problem with this movie is it doesn't really get to the heart of what Colonel Fawcett's mission is or what he hopes to accomplish when finding this lost city. You know that he's an explorer, that's a given, but after he finds this lost city, what is, I didn't get from watching the film what he was planning to do, what sort of gain he was going to make in finding this lost city. He's not an archaeologist. If he was, I would understand what the motivation behind his quest was would be and maybe the motive in fact i think probably the motivation is explained more elaborately in the book written by david gran but unfortunately you're not going to get very much of a straight answer of what he was hoping to accomplish here also he finds evidence of this lost city from what looked to be ancient drawings in the the trees and some of the rocks but how does he know whether th those were drawings made hundreds of years ago or if somebody from the, one of the tribesmen from the Amazon tribes who, who he encounters in the film drew that himself? It just almost seems to, the, the movie almost seems to think, oh, well, here's a cave drawing here and a couple of things there. Well, there's a lost city there, but gotta go. So th this movie is two hours and 21 minutes, and it's really unfortunate because it almost seems to be heated by the amount of 
time it has. And it could have gotten right to the point almost as soon as th this movie got started. And the movie is called The Lost City of Z. So you would expect it's not a movie about actually finding a city. You would think it would be a movie about finding the city itself. But you don't actually get to see the city or this lost city, how it used to be, or how even maybe it used to be. Even more disappointingly, at the very end of the movie, and I won't give away the fate of Colonel Fawcett, but what I will say is that th they say in the end credits that in the 21st century, early in the 21st century, which means a couple of years ago, archaeologists came across more evidence of surprisingly elaborate roads, bridges that suggested that there was a lost city of Z. But that's it. You don't see any photographs. You don't even see... You, you see nothing, basically. It's just that one paragraph at the very end that tells you that there was a lost city, but doesn't exactly tell you why you should care. Of course, the history of humanity is vast. It's over a million years. And there are several, or there's, there were several advanced civilizations. I get that. But it's much more fascinating to see a lot more than just a few drawings in the sand or in rocks. This is a movie. You'd have to, you, you need to see this actually in, in scope. But unfortunately, the motivation here is lost. And I'm very reluctant to give this movie a strike up because I did think the acting was very good. I did think that the, that the adventures that Colonel Fawcett and his men had on the Amazon, the, the three trips they take you see in this movie, are indeed fascinating. But I felt like while I was watching this film, a piece of pertinent history was missing. And that's really unfortunate because a movie like this with such a grandiose title and with a running hour of 2 hours and 21 minutes shouldn't leave you feeling disappointed. But ultimately, it does. Check out. And I don't just watch the films that are out in theaters. I also watch as many as I can that are only available for streaming. And usually, with, my, with the service I subscribe to right now, it's only Netflix. So... The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Sandy Wexler. This is the latest movie from Adam Sandler, his third Netflix film. That is his third film that was, that was made exclusively for Netflix. It came out on streaming a, a couple of weeks ago, and I actually did mean to review it last week, but ultimately I had five other films to review, so I didn't exactly have the time. So who is Sandy Wexler? Sandly, Sandy Wexler, despite... You know, not just a. It, Sandy Wexler is not just a character played by Adam Sandler. He is a talent manager who's working in Los Angeles in the 1990s, diligently representing a group of eccentric clients on the fringe of so, show business. His single minded devotion is put to the test when he falls in love with his newest client, a woman named Courtney Clark a tremendously talented singer whom he discovers at an amusement park. Over the course of a decade, the two of them play out a star-crossed love story. One of my big problems with this film is not Adam Sandler in particular. I, I like a lot of Adam Sandler's earlier films, but lately it sort of seems like Adam Sandler doesn't exactly have a following nowadays. A lot of the people whom I speak to almost seem to think that why is Adam Sandler still making movies and for that matter why is he making the movies he's making I probably think the latter question more than the former and Sandy Wexler is probably Adam Sandler's best film to come out of his Netflix deal but that's not saying a lot considering that his last two films the uh, the ridiculous six and do-over were pretty bad with the do-over actually making my list in 2016 of the second worst film of the year. Sadly, Wexler is not as bad as the do-over, mainly because unlike the do-over, Sandy Wexler is not mean-spirited. But that doesn't mean it's 
not it, it doesn't mean it's particularly good either. The reason it's not good is because it's not particularly funny. Mainly because Sandy Wexler's character, or rather Adam Sandler's character, Sandy Wexler, is not particularly well developed, or at least he's not particularly well developed in this story. Uh, Adam Sandler wears these tacky glasses and has his hair disheveled. He also has a really annoying Bronx accent that he keeps holding on to for. A majority of the film and I was thinking about imitating his accent and telling and sort of showing you how annoying it is but just take my word for it it is really annoying I also didn't think that the love story in this film was necessary and it seems like one of the problems with Adam Sandler in his films is he inserts a love story when it's not particularly necessary but even more so he has no chemistry whatsoever with his love interest in this movie who is well the singer Courtney Clark who's played by Jennifer Hudson now I like Jennifer Hudson and I think she acts very well in this movie not to mention her singing voice is phenomenal but the chemistry between her and Adam Sandler even though Jennifer Hudson tries to have it is just not there and I'm not saying I have a problem with the interracial relationship here. In fact, I think it's actually a very refreshingly welcome change that there's an interracial relationship like this in an Adam Sandler film that's not played for laughs, unlike in his previous movies. I also like the fact that Adam Sandler does not dump on anybody here. In other words, one of my problems with his previous film, The Do-Over, was that it was hugely misogynistic there was not a single likable woman in that film at all in this movie there are several likable films there are women who are around characters and i respect that but my main problem here again is the character of sandy wexler and it's not just that he he has an annoying voice but you're introduced to him through exposition by a, a boatload of celebrity cameos but you're not exactly told what kind of, of talent manager Sandy Wexler is, or at least you're, you're shown it, but almost when it's too little and too late. When he's first introduced, you just see him walking around Sunset Boulevard, and you see him hassling Arsenio Hall, who's one of the cameos in this film. He plays himself. But I didn't know whether Sandy Wexler was a legitimate talent manager. It's one thing to be a talent manager who's down to your luck, it's another thing to be a wannabe. And I, I get the whole dynamic of Hollywood where it's full of a lot of wannabes who talk a big game and don't deliver, unlike maybe 5% of other, of other people who actually make a living from the entertainment business. I get that. But I wasn't sure whether Sandy Wexler was a hack or not. I wasn't sure if he had any glory days or he was just somebody who just kind of showed up and decided one day that he wanted to be a talent manager. Instead, you have these annoying eccentricities that are, that are meant to be sold as running gags but don't really have any room whatsoever for laughs. There's one particularly annoying running gag where... Sandy Wexler, Adam Sandler's character, shows up at various clients. Um, for instance, he, he represents a few comedians, and he laughs and claps at inappropriate times. And there are other characters who say that he does this, that he laughs and claps at inappropriate times, but that just doesn't make the gag any funnier, unfortunately. So Sandy, Sandy Wexler is... An improvement over the do-over and over the Ridiculous Six. But it's still not an indication that Adam Sandler's films are doing as well as they should. And it's certainly no indication that Adam Sandler deserves to have his films return to the box office. Or at least return to movie theaters. And I think he has a long way to go before reestablishing the credibility he had in the 90s. So Sandy Wexler, Sandy Wexler is not a flunk out, but it is a strikeout. It's a movie that's not particularly good. It tries to be funny. And even though I chuckled a couple of times through this movie, which was a huge departure from the do-over, it's still not good enough, and Adam Sandler needs to do a lot better. 
Either way, you could join me. Thank you. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Free Fire. This is a movie that's set in Boston in 1978. However, even though it's set in Boston and a lot of films have been shown have been filmed here in the Boston area, this film was actually filmed in its entirety in Brighton East Sussex, East, excuse me, Brighton East Sussex, England. I don't know why they f- decided to film it in Brighton, England, and not in Brighton, Massachusetts, but the director, Ben Wheatley, is actually from Essex County, England. But even still, if you're going to set the movie in Boston, you might as well film it in Boston. But it doesn't make a particularly huge difference because the majority of this film is, is set in a warehouse. And it's a meeting in a deserted warehouse between two gangs that turns into a shootout and a game of survival. And unfortunately, despite the stellar cast that this movie has, uh, Charlton Copley, who you might remember from District 9 and other such movies, the movie also stars Army Hammer, Brie Larson, Cillian Murphy, and a number of other notable actors. And this film definitely has a lot of influence. I was tempted to say that it shares a lot of influ- influence from Quentin Tarantino, but it's, it's basically influenced greatly by a number of B-movies from the 70s, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think, obviously, Quentin Tarantino has a soft spot in his heart for those kinds of movies, and his influence has since been replicated by or rather taken in by other filmmakers and i i don't doubt that ben wheatley was inspired by quentin tarantino and probably guy pierce when he made this film the problem is not the influence of the film the problem is that the film really has no story so you get that these rival gangs are doing a weapons trade and The most interesting part of the story is when one of the members of the gang actually recognizes another member whose sister he dated and, I guess, sexually coerced unsuccessfully. So that results in one of the gang members pulling out a gun and shooting the guy, understandably. And eventually it it escalates into what should have been a very quick trade into an all-out gunfight. So, all the movie is, in its one hour and 30 minutes, is a gunfight. That is basically the whole story. People hiding, people shooting at one another, and that's pretty much it. And that is really, really disappointing. And also, these are rival gangs who specialize in weapons, and as the movie progresses, you find that a lot of them are really lousy shots. It takes a while for one person to kill another, but one of the big weaknesses of this movie is the blatant continuity errors. Like, for instance, people shoot at one another, and sometimes it's consistent when somebody gets shot that their bullet wound remains throughout the entire movie, but you would actually be surprised by watching this how inconsistent some of these bullet wounds are. I distinctly remember one part near the beginning where Army... Army Hammer's character, who's more of the peacemaker in this movie, by the way, not that it matters, is shot in the arm, and he actually says something to the effect of, ow, I'm shot in the arm. But then a couple of scenes later, not only is he using both arms to to shoot at somebody, but also the bullet wound on his right arm isn't there. There isn't even a tear in his suit. And there are other continuity errors like this throughout the movie as well. But unfortunately, when one gang is shooting at another, I really didn't care. I I didn't really know who was shooting at whom. I didn't know for whom I was supposed to root. I guessed Brie Larson, but that was probably because she's the only woman in the movie. She's literally the only woman in the movie. But I wasn't sure whether to root for her because she's pretty or if she's not exactly, she might be an accomplice, but not a participant. I I just didn't know. 
But therein lies the problem with the movie. You're given a very brief inter introduction to only a limited amount of characters, but what you're not given is a story behind them. You don't know how they joined the gang. You don't know exactly what their motivations are. You don't exactly know what they're going to do after they, they leave the facility. And you're not even sure whether or not you're sad or you, know, you even feel bad for any particular characters. There, this is a movie that wants to have a sense of irony. It wants to be edgy. But unfortunately, it really isn't. Not in any particular way that's particularly memorable. If it wants to be a tribute to those kind of shootout films from the 70s, fine. And a lot of those films might not have been perfect, but at least they had a story. And if Quentin Tarantino were to have directed this film, all of the back characters would have most definitely had a story. In fact, Free Fire is a little in, in plot like The Hateful Eight, but... The problem, that the issue here is The Hateful Eight was a much better movie because it had a backstory through all the characters. And also, it wasn't just one person shooting at another. It was a little bit of that, but there were also other tactics to kill people, particularly creative tactics, which I will not give away, by the way. But the point is, Free Fire has no story, it has no character development, and... I'm not going to get miffed on the fact that it takes place in Boston and it was filmed in England. That's a pet peeve of mine, but a movie that takes place in one area doesn't necessarily have to be filmed in that same area. I get that. It happens all the time. But there was really no point to this film taking place in Boston. There was nothing. It could have taken place in New York. It could have taken place in England. I don't know, but it was in a warehouse, and the fact that they emphasized that it took place in Boston and didn't exactly elaborate upon what made the place unique was really disappointing. So Free Fire gets my rating of, I'd say, a flunk out because it's a movie that has capable actors, but unfortunately, a, a screenplay written by two people that really goes nowhere. And ultimately, by the hour mark, I was checking my watch. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a unique film with actually uh, quite a few big stars in it called Colossal. This is a movie that looks like an independent film, certainly has a plot of a, I wouldn't say a typical independent film because no independent films are typical, but it's certainly quizzical in a way that you would expect a science fiction film on a low budget to be. So Colossal is directed by Nacho Vigalondo, who is a Spanish director, that is, he's from Spain, and he's directed a number of short films and some films that have come out in, in, in Spain to date. Uh, I think probably his only American film other than Colossal to date has been one called Open Windows, which came out in 2014 and stars Elijah Wood and Sasha Gray. But I haven't seen that one. I'm not exactly familiar with Nacho Vigalando's repertoire or his roster of films, but I'll definitely be checking him out after I've, I've seen Colossal, because Colossal is indeed a big surprise of a movie in that I was very surprised how original the plot was and how much I liked it, not to mention, I wouldn't have expected Anne Hathaway, of all people, to be in a movie like this. But what is Colossal about? It is about a woman who's an alcoholic, who at first resides in New York City, but then after her boyfriend kicks her out because of her hard partying ways, she returns to her small town where she grew up, and she ultimately discovers, as she's sobering up and also working for herself, that several catastrophic events are somehow connected to her mental breakdown. So th this is actually really interesting. What, what, are the what are the catastrophic events? Well, in a bizarre turn of events, she finds that as she's working at this particular bar in her in her hometown, and I don't believe her hometown is ever revealed, but it's probably a place in upstate New York. She starts to see news reports about a giant Godzilla-sized monster that's attacking Seoul, South Korea. But you're wondering, as the movie progresses, what's the connection between this bizarre event that's happening on the other side of the world and 
this woman, whose character's name, by the way, is Gloria, again played by Anne Hathaway. Well, I kind of don't want to give it away, and it's not exactly giving away the ending, but it is really neat to see the connection between Anne Hathaway's character and this giant monster. And it would be very difficult to explain what it, what the connection is between these two. But basically, in simplified terms, Anne Hathaway's character and this giant monster have a psychic connection. And ultimately, she reveals this connection to her old friend from school, Oscar, who's played by Jason Sudeikis, in a, in a role where actually Jason Sudeikis starts out as a role you'd expect him to play, kind of a, a nice guy, very approachable. But then ultimately, his character gets darker as well. But the way in which his character gets darker is a little hard to reveal. As I said, this movie is full of surprises, and I really... I liked that. It's also full of a lot of irony and the special effects that create this giant monster in Seoul, South Korea are certainly uh, very impressive. Yeah, they're CGI, but it's CGI done extremely well. I'm not exactly sure what the budget of um, Colossal is. I don't think the budget's ever been revealed, but so far in the United States it's grossed $1.3 million. I hope it it makes more. But again, this is a movie that certainly has the feel of an independent film. I think it probably is an independent film. Why Anne Hathaway chose to be in this movie, I don't exactly know. Because we've seen Anne Hathaway over the last 10 years in movies of much grander scales. In other, And of course, I'm, I'm saying that a movie with a monster as tall as a skyscraper is not on a grand scale, but trust me when I say that there is an independent vibe going through this movie, and I wouldn't have expected Anne Hathaway to be in a movie like this. I would have thought that an actor, more of a, either an up-and-coming actress or an actress who's kind of past her prime, one of those kinds of actresses would have been in this film as well, but... Anne Hathaway does well in the film. I th I think she certainly earns your sympathies when you're when you're watching her on screen, whether or not you like her. And I, I know that Anne Hathaway has a bit of a backlash, probably because of the fact that she's seemingly perfect. But I, I don't know. Nobody's perfect, I guess. But she plays imperfect particularly well, and she also plays someone convincingly who struggles in this movie with alcoholism, probably a reflection of the role she previously played in Rachel Getting Married, probably one of her best roles to date. So I think she brings probably that acting experience with addiction, which she did very well in Rachel Getting Married, into this film. And I, have, I also think that she and Jason Sudeikis have really good chemistry together. I believe this is the first film where they've actually been one-on-one, -on -one, or rather kind of co-starring with one another. And there are also some good supporting performances by other probably actors who have who play it a little bit lower key, such as Austin Stowell and Tim Blake Nelson. So there's a lot to like about Colossal. I really wish I wasn't so vague about the plot, but the, the point of the matter is that Colossal is indeed unique. It does have a strange plot, but it's one that certainly hurt, hooks you. I was, about, I was about to say hurts you. And it's a movie that gets my rating of a knockout. It's one of my favorite movies of the year so far. I think it's, it tells an amazing story. It's very funny. It's very ironic. There are moments in the movie that are very dark. And actually, Jason Sudeikis' character gets darker as, as well. And very convincingly, I might add. Uh, not very much of a connection between his nice guy image and when he ultimately becomes a little bit more corrupt. But you'll see what I mean when you see the movie. I hope you see it. So that's my recommendation. Okay. That is it with my reviews. It's not the end of the show, though, so I hope you stick around. Now I'm going to give you what's coming out next. Excuse me, what's coming up next. 
That is the segment of my show where I give you a synopsis of the movies that are coming out, what I think they might be like, and whether or not I'm going to see them. And usually, I see about three to five movies a week, so I tend to see a majority of the films that I tell you I'm going to see, but then again, I, I'm always surprised to see what's coming out in theaters near me, and the, the movies I'm going to review are subject to change, so just, just keep that in mind. A movie I'm definitely going to see 100% is coming out this weekend. I think it might be number two or number three at the box office. That's what I'm predicting, but don't take my word for it. The movie The Circle, and the, the Circle not only boasts a stellar cast of Emma Watson and Tom Hanks as well as other actors, but also it's based on a terrific novel written by David Eggers, who also co-wrote the screenplay here. So I'll just give you the synopsis, then I'll let you know what I think of the book. A woman, Emma Watson, lands a dream job at a powerful tech company called The Circle, only to uncover a nefarious agenda that will affect the lives of her friends, family, and that of humanity. So, I will see this movie, I'll let you know what I think, but I urge you, before going to see the movie, read the book first. It is 450 pages in its paperback form, but trust me when I say that it is well worth the read. It is absolutely well worth it. It's, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite books of recent years. I like David Eggers' writing a lot, and this is a movie that certainly, uh, excuse me, it's a book, it's a story that's certainly very compelling, but it also makes you think. Is it prophetic? I'll talk more about that next week, but I will let you know exactly what I think of the movie adaptation of The Circle when I see it. The other movies that are coming out are not necessarily in limited release, but they certainly have a limited audience, it would seem, like this movie right here. The movie called How to Be a Latin Lover, which, as you can imagine, is a comedy, and I wouldn't get very much out of it because I'm not Latin at all, at least not that I know of. But How to Be a Latin Lover is about a man who, finding himself dumped after 25 years of marriage, made a career of seducing rich older women... Um, and must move in with his estranged sister, where he begins to learn the value of family. Okay, so he's not becoming a Latin lover, I don't think, but anyway. So the the titular character is played by H H Eugenio or Eugenio Derbez, who I've never heard of before. It, the movie also co-stars Salma Hayek, Rob Lowe, Kristen Bell, Raquel Welch, Rob Corddry, and Rob Riggle. So, yeah, it has a good cast other than Eugenio Derbez, but I can't say for sure whether or not it's a film that's worth watching. But if it comes out in the theater near me, I'll definitely take a look at it, and I'll let you know what I think. Another film that's expected to be released in wide release, but may not necessarily be that way, is a movie called Slight. This is a movie that's billed as an action drama sci-fi thriller about a young street magician who's played by an actor named Jacob Lattimore. And I don't know very much about Jacob Lattimore. He is an African-American actor who is actually 20 years old, soon to be 21. But anyway... Um, this young street magician, magician, excuse me, is left to care for his little sister <clears throat> after their parents' passing, and he turns to illegal activities to keep a roof over their heads. When he gets in too deep, his sister is kidnapped, and he is forced to use his magic and brilliant mind to save her. So, of the list of actors in this movie that, that I'm given so far, um, there's Jacob Lattimore, Seychelle G Gabriel, Dulé Hill, and Storm Reed. The only one I'm familiar with is Dulé Hill, who's been in such movies as She's All That, where he was the token black guy. He's also co-starred in the movie Psych. He was on The West Wing uh, as, as a main character. But either way, Slight... I hope comes out in the theater near me because the the synopsis I just read for you right there sounds really interesting, uh, and on a lot of levels. And 
I usually have to cross my fingers and hope for such movies with a predominantly African-American cast to come out in a theater near me because, let's face it, movies with predominantly African-American casts usually don't get a wide release. Of course, there's the case of the movie Get Out, which grossed $175 million domestically so far, but that's one of the exceptions. Plus, the cast of that movie was not predominantly African-American, but anyway... That's it for Words on Film for this week. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, which you can hear on this network, Boston Free Radio, from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And as always, I'll see you at the movies.